Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Tegan Clary, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Unchained Labs. I will be your moderator, and I'm very glad you've decided to spend part of your day with us. Before we get started with the seminar, I want to remind any of our customers joining us today that Unchained Labs is dedicated to supporting our customers through this challenging time. Please do not hesitate to get in touch with your local salesperson, application scientist, the service engineer, or you can contact us directly at our website if there's anything you need. We're ready to do everything we can to help you. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. To ask questions, all you have to do is click on the Q&A um, little button in the Zoom navigation bar at the bottom or top of your screen and type your question. At the end, we will get to as many of them as we can. And now I'd like to introduce Anna Winchowska, one of our fantastic application scientists. Today, Anna will be taking us through how the UNCLE platform can provide formulators with a comprehensive view of stability throughout early screening and development. Now, I'll hand it over to Anna. Welcome everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar. Today, we will be discussing several tools available in the uncle that are used to understand protein stability and how they can help in protein characterization, formulation screening, and candidate selection. Let me first introduce you to our uncle. Uncle is a multimodal pyrologic stability platform that combines three detection methods fluorescence, static light scattering, or SLS, and dynamic light scattering, or DLS. ANCO can measure the full spectrum fluorescence from 250 nanometers to 720 nanometers to look at both the intrinsic fluorescence of tryptophan and tyrosine and the fluorescence of protein dyes. The static light scattering is measured simultaneously with fluorescence and helps you to understand the sample aggregation behavior. Dynamic light scattering gives you information about the sizing and polydispersity of the sample and can be used for a quality check of the sample. The ANCO has a pulchier temperature control element and you can run experiments at a user-defined constant temperature or perform a variety of temperature ramps between 15 degrees Celsius and 95 degrees Celsius. The combination of the three detection methods in the ANCO allows for 12 different applications that answer specific questions around protein stability. For example, fluorescence, both intrinsic and extrinsic, is used to obtain the unfolding temperature of the protein, TM, which is amongst one of the first go-to parameters for stability screening. Intrinsic fluorescence is also used in the uncle to obtain protein thermodynamic stability information in the delta G application, or to understand the impact of temperature shifts on stability in the thermal recovery application. Light scattering measurements, on the other hand, are used in the uncle to help understand protein aggregation behavior or self-association propensity in the B22, KD and G22 applications. One of the most powerful tools in the uncle for formulation screening is a tm tiac application, which is used to obtain protein thermal unfolding and aggregation information in a single experiment. In this application, protein intrinsic fluorescence and SLS are monitored simultaneously as the temperature increases, and DLS data is gathered before and after the thermal ramp. The fluorescence thermal profile allows for determination of the midpoints of unfolding events, TMs, and the SLS data give the information about the onset of aggregation expressed as TAG. The simultaneous measurements help correlate protein unfolding with aggregation events over a temperature course. The temperature profiles are built from the analysis of changes in SLS signal and full spectrum fluorescence as the temperature increases. As the samples are heated, the environment around aromatic groups undergoes disruption and consequently we observe changes in the fluorescence signal both intensity and position of the emission band. Additionally, the full spectrum fluorescence allows for flexible data analysis and in the uncle the data analysis is done automatically. The principle of SLS measurement is that the larger particles scatter more light. As the proteins aggregate during the thermal ramp, the SLS signal increases and this allows us to see when the aggregation occurs. 
In the TMTLAG application, the DLS is performed at the start and end temperature of the thermal ramp. The DLS at the initial temperature allows us to check the condition of the sample prior to thermal stress and see whether the sample is monodispersed and of good quality or already contains aggregates. The DLS at the end temperature gives information about the state of the protein after the sample has been stressed, with both sizing and for dispersed data also available. Because DLS is a non-destructive technique, this is a quick QC step done on the exact same sample that provides complementary information to fluorescence and SLS data. Additionally, DLS in the ANCO can be used independently, independently in other applications such as sizing and polydispersity or in sizing with thermal ramp application. A single tmt experiment provides eight data points. Full spectrum fluorescence for every temperature point allows for flexible data analysis and determination of both the TM and onset of unfolding. SLS data from two different lasers, 266 nanometers and 473 nanometers, provides aggregation onset temperatures. SLS 266 has greater sensitivity and allows for detection of aggregates at lower concentrations. SLS 473 extends the dynamic range and can measure aggregation at higher sample concentrations. The DLS measurements provide the size and size distribution data at initial and end temperatures, as well as the polydispersity of the sample, which essentially gives sample quality information and the measure of sample homogeneity at the two temperature points. Here we have an example of excipient screening where we are looking at the thermal stability of protein P1 in four histidine buffers without additive and containing sodium chloride, sucrose or arginine. These are protein unfolding curves using intrinsic fluorescence. As you can see, each curve shows two transitions, the first above 60 degrees Celsius and the second after 75 degrees Celsius. There are small differences between the four thermal profiles and these are reflected in the TM values. As we can see, the sodium chloride containing buffer shows the lowest TM1 of 62 degrees and the sucrose the highest at 64.3 degrees Celsius. Additionally, the second transitions for no excipient conditions and for sucrose take place at 75.7 .7 degrees and 76.1 degrees Celsius respectively. There are also distinctive transitions at 81.6 degrees Celsius and 84.7 degrees Celsius for sodium chloride and arginine condition. In this figure, we see the fluorescence thermal profile of histine and arginine buffer overlaid with SLS data at 266 nanometers. As you can see, the unfolding event with a TM at 63.3 degrees Celsius leads to a substantial increase in SLS signal, which indicates, uh, indicates aggregation with onset at 71.5 degrees Celsius. The second fluorescence transition occurs after the sample has aggregated. There is also a sudden drop in SLS signal after 80 degrees Celsius, which may indicate aggregate precipitation. Here we can see that the aggregation behavior of the four samples varies significantly with buffer composition. Early aggregation and large particle formation is undesirable and in this example, sodium chloride and arginine com conditions show aggregation above 60 degrees Celsius with a TAG of 67.7 degrees Celsius for so sodium chloride and 71.5 degrees Celsius for arginine. Comparatively, there is only a small increase in SLS for sucrose and buffer with no additive indicated smaller particle formation in these conditions. Additionally, SLS profiles of both buffer conditions show stepwise increase in SLS 266 intensity throughout the TRAMP. The power of the ANCO is that it collects the fluorescence and SLS data simultaneously, allowing for correlation of unfolding and aggregation events. Here is an overlay of fluorescence and SLS thermal profiles for sucrose-containing buffer. We observe a two-step unfolding event with TM1 at 62.2 degrees Celsius and TM2 at 76.1 degrees Celsius. The SLS profile matches that of fluorescence and similar profiles are observed also for histidine buffer with no additive. In this experiment, the DLS data was collected before and after thermal ramp. The DLS data collection in the TMT AG application is optional and the user can define whether they would like the DLS before thermal ramp, after or both. Again, the DLS at the initial temperature allows us to check the condition of the sample prior to thermal stress. Here, the size distribution profiles at 15 degrees Celsius for the first three, 
He stayed in the bathroom without additive, with sodium chloride and with sucrose showed two peaks. Peak 1 at around 10 nanometers and peak 2 at around 30 to 40 nanometers. However, the second species is clearly present in small amounts, less than 0.5% by mass. From SLS thermal profiles, we observed only a small increase in SLS for histidine and no excipient containing buffer, but large increase in SLS intensity for sodium chloride and arginine containing buffer. From the DLS at 95 degrees Celsius, we see that sodium chloride and arginine conditions result in average size of more than 1000 nanometers compared with only a three times increase in size for sucrose and no excipient conditions. This dataset highlights the complementary of DLS and SLS measurements within one application. To summarize, in this excipient screening experiment, we see that the unfolding behavior of protein P1 in all four buffer conditions is similar, with TM1 values between 62 degrees Celsius for sodium chloride conditions and 64.2 degrees Celsius for sucrose. The SLS data, however, allows for clear differentiation between the buffer conditions and shows that following unfolding, two buffer conditions, sodium chloride and arginine, led to aggregation which is undesirable, making these two conditions the least favorable. Both sucrose and arginine containing buffers do not form very large aggregates when thermally stressed, and these conditions provide more stable environment for P1 with sucrose appearing to be the best. The TMT Ag application in Bianco is very powerful and allows us to get a better understanding of protein thermal behavior by providing both unfolding and aggregation information simultaneously in one experiment with only 9 microliters of sample. The combination of fluorescence, static light scattering and dynamic light scattering in one application allows us to make more informed decisions in the initial stability screening and ranking beyond just relying on the TM values. Now, this is what sometimes happens in formulation screening. If formulation alterations are subtle, for example, very small pH changes or variation in excipient concentration, we may get conditions that essentially look identical by TM and even TIAG, and you cannot differentiate between them. Delta G adds an additional level of information to stability assessment by quantifying stability and determining the amount of denatured protein present in a protein sample at equilibrium and at ambient temperatures. This means that we can use delta G to further refine formulations after first screening with TM and TIAG. ANCO can obtain delta G using isothermal chemical denaturation, which essentially looks at changes in protein intrinsic fluorescence as we add a denaturant such as urea or guanidinium hydrochloride. Here you can see chemical denaturation curves with two distinct unfolding transitions for a monoclonal antibody at three different pH conditions, 4, 4.3, and 4.6. Stability analysis with delta G identifies 10 millimolar acetate buffer at pH 4.6 as having the highest delta G and therefore the most stable formulation. Again, ANCO's multimodal capabilities allow for stability testing at both qualitative and quantitative Formulation screening also requires assessment of protein colloidal stability. Light scattering measurements in the ANCO allow us to assess the protein colloidal stability by probing the interactions between different molecules in a solution. ANCO can determine two measures of intermolecular interactions, B22, also known as second virial coefficient, and KD, diffusion interaction parameter. In the ANCO, the two parameters are determined simultaneously and we are essentially looking at how the sample scatters light as we increase the protein concentration. If the B22 and KD are positive, we have repulsive interactions, and if these parameters are negative, then the interactions are attractive, and therefore the protein shows self-association propensity. In these graphs, we have B22 and KD data for a monoclonal antibody in four formulations, in histidine buffer with no excipient, and with sodium chloride, sucrose, and arginine. As you can see in the KD data on the left, the histidine buffer and histidine buffer with sucrose give positive slopes and the highest KD values, therefore showing the strongest repulsive interactions. Arginine buffer, on the other hand, gives a negative slope, which indicates attractive interactions and a propensity for self-association, resulting in the least favorable conditions. 
The B22 data on the right aligns with the KD data. Sucrose and no excipient conditions result in steep positive slopes and highest B22 values, indicating repulsive protein protein interactions and most favorable conditions. B22 and KD enable characterization of colloidal stability for protein concentrations of up to 20 mg per ml. For higher concentrations, we can use ANCO's G22 application, which accounts for molecular crowding conditions. Here we have an example of G22 data for a protein in phosphate buffer with and without sodium chloride. Strong upward trends for both conditions suggest net attractive interactions and G22 values for no sodium chloride for phosphate buffer is highest, suggesting stronger attractive forces. The formulation screening process with the uncle can also expand towards kinetic characterization. The activity of a potential drug decreases with aggregation, which is often linked to protein unfolding, and these processes are time dependent. The isothermal stability application in the ANCO allows us to jumpstart the accelerated stability studies and look at the kinetics of unfolding and aggregation by determining rates of these processes at the chosen temperature simultaneously. This application can also be used to fine-tune formulations or for process optimization. Here's an example of isothermal stability data for IgG in the presence of different concentrations of arginine over the time course of 8 hours. As you can see, IgG on its own aggregates very quickly and 10 millimolar arginine is insufficient to suppress IgG aggregation. Increasing the arginine concentration to 100 millimolar indeed slows down the process and 500 millimolar arginine conditions completely suppresses the IgG aggregation. In the same way, we can monitor DLS and look at changes in size and polydispersity of the sample over time. These long runs are only doable because in the uncle the sample is sealed in a quartz cuvette and no sample evaporation takes place throughout the experiment. From first screening to in-depth characterization, we have seen that ANCO can help with choosing the most promising formulation for your protein. ANCO can measure up to 48 samples in any one experimental setup with one-click analysis, which makes the process quick and easy. ANCO's different detection methods and variety of applications can provide a more complete picture of your protein stability, allowing for more informed decisions in characterization, formulation screening and candidate selection. Use the TM and TIAG application to screen out unstable formulation conditions and refine further with delta G, colloidal and kinetic stability data. We are excited to announce the launch of our brand new application focused on gene therapy and vaccine development. The new application will be, will be available in all new uncles and will help researchers better understand the stability of adeno-associated viruses, AAVs. The new application allows you to better understand both capsid stability and DNA release. Capsid stability is measured using intrinsic fluorescence of capsid proteins with changes as proteins unfold and capsid undergoes disruption. Genome ejection, on the other hand, is monitored using extrinsic fluorescence of cybergold dye that has a high affinity towards nucleic acids, and for this ANCO uses 473 nanometers excitation. We can obtain some stability metrics such as TMs and onset of aggregation of capsid proteins and we can also look into quantification of initial free DNA and total DNA release. There is a good correlation between light scattering intensity and particle count, and ANCO measures particle intensity to help obtain particle concentration in the samples. All these features and more are available in the new ANCOs under Viral Toolbox application. If you would like to learn more about the new ANCO or other products of Unchained Labs, please reach out to info at unchainedlabs.com or to me, anna.leczkowska at unchainedlabs.com. Please also join us for our upcoming events. Links can be found in the event section of unchainedlabs.com. Thank you, Anna, for that great overview of how Uncle can help a formulator screen for and identify the best formulations and to keep their protein stable. We have some great questions that have already been submitted. You can still ask a question by entering it in the Q&A section of your Zoom navigation bar. 
So Anna, let's get started with some of the questions. Um, first, can you remind us about the consumable that the uncle uses and how much sample do I need for a typical TM TAG experiment? Sure. Um, so the consumable the uncle uses is called a uni. And basically it's a 16 quartz cuvettes that are embedded into a metal frame. Uh, now the metal frame is used for efficient heat transfer and the uni is contained for the actual experiment. The uni is contained or uh, locked in a metal in the in a frame containing silicon seals uh, to basically close the samples and lock the samples in, in so there is no any evaporation during the experiment. So each unit takes nine microliters of sample and that's all you need to, to run the experiment CMTAG. Okay, great. Thanks, Anna. Um, Anna, there are a couple of questions on, on the static light scattering. So let's tackle those, okay? Um, the first question on static light scattering, can the SLS at starting temperature or room temperature give information on aggregate content as well? Right, so um, the short, word is, short answer is probably no. Uh, and the reason is that uh, we actually look at only intensity. We are getting a total intensity of the whole sample. So whatever you have in the sample, it, it will give a combined intensity uh, as, a, as a number of counts. And there is no way to deconvolute that. Uh, and therefore, there is no way of saying how much aggregate or other species we have. However, we do use um, DLS, dynamic light scattering, in order to look at uh, the content of the sample in terms of uh, what we have, how many pop populations we have. And uh, DLS will give us an approximate, approximate uh, of, uh, approximation of the uh, content of the aggregate using the mass uh, the convolution, not sorry, mass uh, distribution in there. Okay, thanks, Anna. Um, the second question on SLS, can you explain the units that are represented for SLS? Um, what do they mean? Is it a number of particles um, of, of a par particular size? If yes, what size? Right, so um, the unit that we use in the SLS is a number of counts. So we are literally looking at the photons, number of photons in here. Uh, the, the bigger the particle, the more the, more the particle will scatter the light. So that's basically what we're looking at. Uh, we can we can look at the size of the particle based on the uh, light scattering, but that would be more a DLS measurement. Okay, thanks, Anna. Um, moving to a question about um, the uh, TM measurements. Um, in one of the experiments that showed four different uh, TM values or TM ones. Um, they were very similar. So I think there was a range of 62 to 64 degrees Celsius. Um, are these values really different? And is there a way of obtaining um, any confidence in this? Right, so when we actually do differentiation of the samples or um, at stability, uh, in terms of the stability uh, using the TM, we really have to look into how different the TMs have to be in order to be able to to run the sample stability. Uh, the differences of uh, one or two degrees is probably, it's, it's okay to have those, but it's probably not enough to have informed decision and therefore having this additional uh, aggregation data, TIAG, is very useful to, 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 have, to have in there. Um, so yes, I would say it's, it's good to be able to differentiate, um, to be able to get these different uh, TMs, but perhaps an additional um, level of differentiation would be would be needed in here. Therefore, in the examples I showed, uh, I used the TIAG data in here. Now in terms of the confidence, obviously we can uh, do a um, repeats or replicates and obviously get the percent CV or standard deviation and that will give us a little bit more confidence in the accuracy of that TM data. But overall, I would say one degree um, difference in a TM is probably not enough to be able to differentiate properly um, in, in based purely on the TM. Okay. Um, Anna, here's a question for you with regards to one of the formulations that you used. And if you don't, if you don't have the answer to this one, we can follow up with um, this question afterwards. But 
Um, the question here was, it says, in our hands, sucrose, sucrose often adds artificial sample heterogeneity due to a small amount of dextrin being present. And this did not seem to be apparent in your experiments. Um, could you point us toward a brand of sucrose that um, is ideally suited or doesn't show this? Right, so I, we probably would need to look into the data for this. I would, one thing I, I can say that sucrose normally would be, if, if there is a large amount of sucrose, particularly in the LS uh, experiments, you will be able to see this additional peak um, in a, um, you know, in a small size ranges. So that would be one way of looking at it. Um, perhaps it would be great to look at the data and just troubleshoot based on, based on the, uh, what you got from, from the instrument. Um, but yes, that, that's, that's something that we need to follow up on probably. Okay. Um, another question for you, this one specifically about, um, um, is it possible to analyze uh, tryptophan oxidation in the uncle? Is that something we're able to see? I actually don't have much experience on this. Um, so probably I'll need to get back on, on this question too at some point um, after the webinar. Okay. Thanks, Anna. Um, Anna, uh, how long does it take typically to do a TM um, and TAG experiment? And how long would it take to do a full run of the instrument of 48 samples? Right, so uh, the duration of the experiment is really dependent on, on the user settings. So there are variables such as ramp rate and what you actually want to run within the TMTAG. Mm, in terms of the ramp rate, obviously the duration of the experiment will be de dependent on the, you know, whether you set it to one degree minute or, or 0.5 degree minute or any other ramp, ramp rates that are, av are available. Um, and of course, whether or not we do DLS before and or after uh, the thermal ramp. So the typical uh, experimental duration, for example, for one uh, degree minute ramp rate uh, would be around two and a half hours. So we have 90 minutes of the ramp rate, in, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the ramp, the actual ramp uh, data collection, and then we have to allow it for the DLS before and after. So that will be around, will be around two and a half hours. Okay, thanks, Anna. Anna, do you do you usually run the samples in replicates? Um, and because this this question, and then to elaborate, just says I've noticed that sometimes you get different values and peaks from DLS experiments for the same sample in, in replicates. Yes, yeah, so it's always a good idea to run replicates, and uh, definitely to have a confidence in the data that we have from any instrument, regardless of of what kind of experiments we are running. Um, in, in the DLS case, of course, uh, the more heterogeneous the sample is, the, the better it is, the, the, the more important it is to have a little bit more replicates in order to have uh, a little bit more data points in there. Um, but yes, I, I, I would definitely recommend running replicates. Okay. Um, Anna, is it possible to measure aggregation of peptides using the alcohol? Can, can we analyze peptides? Uh, yes, I don't see why not. Obviously, that will depend on how big the peptides are uh, or how long. Um, but we have uh, we have got some experience in uh, peptide analysis using a TMTAC um, application, and we've seen some aggregation in there. But uh, again, it depends how large they are, um, because obviously we need to be able to 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 detect them. Um, okay, Anna, what's the typical ramp rate that should be used for a TM or TAG? Uh, experiment. Right, so the typical ramp rate that that we use is one degree a minute or 0.5 degree a minute. Uh, we have to remember in here that, um, you know, we, whenever we compare the results or do any kind of ranking, we use the same ramp rate for all the samples that we compare with uh, between. And uh, that's basically the, the rule of the thumb in here. One thing I would have to um, mention in here is actually that high, high ramp rate or very fast ramps are probably not a good idea because we will not capture all the changes or all the effects that happen during the ramp rate. That's why the one degree or 0.5 degree a minute is, is a go-to um, ramp rate for thermal experiments in order to get TM and TIAG values. Okay, thank you, Anna. 
And Anna, I think this will be our last question for the day. Um, is there a way to design your own experiment, Yonkel? So to incorporate different measurements um, the way that somebody would like to um, their own way? Uh, yes, well, the short answer is definitely yes. Uh, so the, in the Yonkel, we have 12 applications. Um, so the 12 applications that we have are in a way fixed. So in terms of what we are looking at and how we do the experiment, but there is a lot of flexibility in terms of how we do that experiment. So we can, again, in a TM TIAG experiment, we can choose a ramp rate that we want to use. Uh, we can choose whether or not we do the DLS before and after. So that's the 12 application. In addition to these 12 applications, we also have a, um, an option that is called a freeform mode. And it, this freeform mode gives you a full flexibility in terms of the experiment setup. So you can choose, um, we can choose how many steps you want to have within the experiment, whether, whether you go up and down with, the, uh, with, your, with your ramps, for example, or you can have an isothermal um, section in the middle, for example, and you can choose duration of the steps and the method of detection. So it gives you a full flexibility in terms of what we are doing and how we collect the data and what we are looking at as well. Great, thank you, Anna. <clears throat> hey, Anna, thank you for answering all these great questions today. Um, and thank you for a great presentation, appreciate it. I also wanna thank all of you who joined us live today. Um, with many of us working from home these days, and I think uh, I know I am and I know many other people are, this is a great time to explore new ideas and solutions to problems. If you'd like to have a deeper conversation with our team about the uncle and how it can fit into your work, please do get in touch with us. Um, Anna gave you the, the information of how to get in touch with her, um, and um, I'm sure she'd love to talk to any of you about the uncle and how um, your work and how it might fit in. Um, our team would love to connect with you over Zoom meetings. Um, this is a Zoom webinar, but we're also interested in just smaller groups or one-on-one um, -on -one meetings over Zoom. Um, all of our team members, application scientists, salespeople have uh, Zoom and are, are ready to have those meetings at any time. Thank you again for attending our virtual seminar and I hope you have a great rest of your day.